Who taught you to hate your own kind? Who taught you to hate the race that you belong to? So much so that you don't want to be around each other. No, before you come asking Mr. Muhammad, does he teach hate? You should ask yourself, who taught you to hate being what God gave you? Most of us blacks, or Negroes as he called us, really thought we were free without being aware that in our subconscious, all those chains we thought had been struck off were still there. And there were many ways where what really motivated us, motivated us was our desire to be loved by the white man. Malcolm meant to lance that sense of inferiority. He knew it would be painful. He knew that people could kill you because of it, but he dared to take that risk. Uh, welcome to the Gilchrist Experience. It's my, it's my real Hello. pleasure to uh, introduce you to uh, my, f my family here from Harlem. Uh, we've got uh, Wayne Francis, the executive director of the Boys and Girls Club. Uh, he's our new executive director, and he's been here, what, six months now? About, no, about eight months now. Eight months, and uh, we've got a lot of things going. Mm -hmm. I've invited him down here to see what it's like at the MNN, Ma Ma Manhattan Neighborhood Network, you know, my favorite place on the planet. And I think we'll eventually uh, get an M&N &M uptown at the Boys and Girls Club. Well, at least the training and all the possibilities that uh, a place like this uh, has to offer young minds. And of course, uh, Joe Rogers of Equity. Total Equity teaching now. Total Equity now. Yeah. Um, the E is foremost, so you see uh, it yeah, here. Yeah. And Joe is an uh, entrepreneur. Tell us about yourself sure, a little bit, before um, we go to Wayne. I wear a number of hats, but I'm the founder and facilitator of Total Equity Now, which empowers Harlemites as active participants and decision makers in advancing educational excellence and equity across our village, which is a fancy and long way of saying we want to get more Harlemites involved in strengthening education in our community. All right. And you see that uh, your association with Wayne Francis is going to be a good one, I see. I, I brought you two guys together because you're the up-and-coming young men uh, on the scene uh, and training our youth. And all I want to do is get them to pull their pants up. And we get that much. I'll be happy. It's not us. You don't want to get us to pull our pants up. You're talking no, about okay. get them to pull okay. their pants up. Of course. Tell us a little bit about yourself, Wayne. Well, um, as you stated, I've been with the Boys and Girls Club since January of this year. Uh, right. Prior to the club, I worked at Columbia University within okay. the Human Resources area, um, promoting uh, community employment and helping local residents of Harlem to right. be able to take advantage of some of the employment opportunities at the university. I've also done some work in the area of workforce development and also youth services, of course, which is uh, what attracted me to the Boys and Girls Club mm -hmm. and vice versa. Well, your, your, your direct association with the Boys and Girls Club, of course, is dealing with kids. And you have four of your own. You just had a, a yes. newborn. Beautiful Congratulations. daughter named London. Yes, yeah. two months old now. Yeah. Yes. Yes, so you and Joe, uh, I think you two have uh, uh, arranged a couple of meetings where you can do something in, uh, together. In yeah, tandem. we've been exchanging emails and, and uh, talking about how we can connect with other organizations that uh, provide youth development services okay. in Harlem so we can definitely strengthen our outreach to the local community and see what we can do for these young people. Thank, Thank you for the introduction again. Appreciate it. Yeah. Say again? Thank you for the introduction. Oh, yeah, they, yeah, 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 I, I want to see all highlights so. gather around and, and a big uh, uh, group and take care of our kids because you know, they need some help. Yeah. yeah obviously. You yeah. know, uh, all of us had some sort of uh, uh, training as kids. You know, I was part of the PAL back in the days. When, when cops, well, we have a police officer with us, ex-police officer. But, I mean, cops were on the corner. I mean, they were your friend. And I like today, stop and stop questioning. First has been a, a, a total disaster here in Harlem, but uh, that's going to stop with de Blasio uh, perhaps coming on our show. And then if you're welcome to the show, Graham. Tell hey, us what's up. How you doing? <laughs> so you're Glad dealing with the uh, kids out in Brooklyn. Yeah. Tell us about your experience. Well, we're training kids. Uh, a week ago, a week, week and a half ago, there was a group of us that met on Bristol Street uh, outside the residence of the little boy antique who had been shot in that gunplay with the gang members between his father and the guys. Um, 
Eric Adams had called for 200 men in suits to come to the location. And we had more than 200 men. They came from Brooklyn, Manhattan. They came from Queens. I think one, one guy I know came from Staten Island. Mm -hmm. And, um, you know, there is nothing that the police can do unless people choose to do. And what do I mean right. by that? I was in a meeting with Ray Kelly a couple of years ago, you know, about the police policy. And he tried to flip it. Well, what about black on black crime? That was not the mm -hmm. subject of the meeting. But they talk about crime going down, crime going up. It's not just the police who bring crime down or through their lack of enforcement it goes back up. It's the people themselves. Yeah. It's when people choose to do A as opposed to B. Crime dropped for a number of years in the city because a lot of young folks, you, you don't see young folks snatching pocketbooks. Mm. We don't see them snatching gold jewelry, necklaces, and rings from women's ears. So the, the attitude and the mindset of the young people has changed. Yes, there is a gang problem, but overall, the everyday young person, the guy on the block, mm -hmm. he's not out there engaged in snatching pocketbooks and robbing people and, and doing those things. And that credit needs to be given to the community. Mm -hmm. It needs to be given to parents. It needs to be given to gentlemen such as yourselves that are working with with youth and giving them some outlets and opportunities. And it's, it's not just because the police have been, quote unquote, stopping and frisking people. Mm. And mm -hmm. the, the little games that Bloomberg is playing and Kelly wants to play with, oh, we had all these shootings um, since the judge came down with the ruling. We've been having shootings. And it's just what media wants to play up or play down. They can play up Miley Cyrus they can play up stupidity, yeah. and people will feed on the stupidity. Yeah. The, the media will feed up, will play up anything. But when the community decides, when young people decide that they want, if they're not in school, they want to get a job or whatever it is that they want to do, as opposed to running the streets, then that credit needs to be given to our youth. Well, hopefully we can yeah. be, become a part of that that outlet uh, with the Boys and Girls Club. We, we have so many, I have, I mean, I've been on the club over 10 years now, and I have a fantasy about gathering up our youth. I mean, we've got uh, the, uh, the high school there, uh, Frederick, Frederick Douglass. Douglass. Academy. Uh, mm -hmm. Now, I've got a granddaughter in that school now, mm -hmm. just started this year. Okay. And uh, my grandson is a videographer and an editor, and so uh, there's lots of spots we can gather kids from there and start training them in, to eventually bring them down here and become producers. Something, uh, you know, it's a trade. It's, a, it's an awareness I think everybody needs to be aware of. It, it's what, you, what you appear to be. You're whole, we're talking about the history of black people. When you learn that uh, as the Moors came to, to, to Europe in 7-Eleven, the, the Romans had ran, it was, it was in turmoil. They were in the Dark Ages, and black people came to Europe and civilized Europe. Mm -hmm. But how many black people know that? <laughs> how, many, how, many, how many of us really know how powerful you've always been in the past? And that's your... I'm oh, sorry. No, go ahead, go ahead. So you're talking about it creating the um, studio at the Boys and Girls Club. Of course. We'll create sort of a West Harlem satellite in the same way that El Barrio Firehouse exactly. Studios. Right. They exactly. have in East Harlem, There's exactly. one, they, and they train young people. I've sent right. some young people there. Yeah. But it'd be great to have one in East Harlem and West Harlem if the community could uh, uh, benefit from and it. And I've got an executive director here that's willing to, to I mean, uh, m and oh, okay. <laughs> Our executive director. Mm -hmm. that's, we've talked about this, um, you know, and uh, to bring it and get National Action ne Network. Mm -hmm. and there's a, a work site right there. We could do trainings, training uh, right there on 145th Street in Lenox mm -hmm. with, with Reverend Sharpton. And we could do my show there live with the possible feed, a live feed. I mean, there's so many things we can do. So you're really this is live streaming, so the world can see what mm -hmm. we're doing. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So really, at the end of the day, you're just trying to cut down on your commute 
He's trying to extend mine. He's trying to come all the way down. He right. He's trying to extend mine and decrease his. Why are you blaming? Keep it all in the it's all in the family. I mean, I'm excited about you being here today, but I want you to see my home. I've been here what 15 years, so I mean, this is. I took this in school. Uh, TV production. Yeah, TV yeah. production. And it cost me eight thousand dollars, and that's back in '89. <laughs> okay. We won't my talk first about student loan. I was forty-nine. The today. Forty-eight that's years money. old. Yeah. That was my second career, well, but I've enjoyed it. One of the things that we were doing to, to that uh, end is at our Manhattanville clubhouse located yep. in Manhattanville houses on 133rd between Broadway right. and Amsterdam. This past uh, spring, we started an initiative where we were teaching the young people videography, and they actually produced two PSAs, okay. public service announcements, one on safe sex and one on um, smoking prevention. Okay. And the young people, they wrote their own treatments, uh, they shot the right. video, they worked on the editing, and they created costumes and, you know, really... Okay did their own thing right there out of the community center uh -huh. and it's it's located on our website now harlembgc.org okay. on our tumblr page and you can be able to see that and they you know they did a very good job for initial entree into the good, whole video good, production good. thing so well, the foundation is being laid for the vision that you have good 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 you know there is also a uh, a program with the city a number of tv shows are being shot in new york right now right and that is adding to the job market here in right. New York. Right, right, um, right. Last week, just on, on my block, they were shooting Boardwalk Empire. Really? And, uh, yeah. Okay. And they utilize, um, it's a historic district, so mm -hmm. all the housing and everything is of a certain uh, architectural design. Mm -hmm. And two doors from me, they utilize the house um, of the people. They just bought this house earlier this year. And they would pay fifty thousand wow. dollars for wow. the use of the house for the day. Wow. Um, the building across the street, there's a large apartment building with a big courtyard and a very rustic design. And they paid the owners of that apartment building even more money to shoot the, the actors coming and going through the courtyard. Um, it's a it, you know production and movies are it's a big industry, um, but our young people can get in as production right. assistants right. and learn the trade. You know, coming to M and N and then moving on right. from M and N, but this can be a launch pad in what you're doing, availing kids of opportunities that we didn't have growing up. Yeah, you know, and exposing them to different venues. Um, who wants to work at McDonald's? Who wants right, to work at right. Starbucks? Um, right. You want to do something that's solid, productive, and, and where you develop the craft. Right. You know, and uh, they're shooting locations all over New York. Yeah. And See? what's even more important is learning how to use a camera. I've mm -hmm. been a photographer all my life. I mean, I started a photography company at 14. So that's always been a part of my DNA. <laughs> mm -hmm. And I moved up from photography to, to video. And it was such an easy transition. And all the principles I learned in photography over the years had definitely applied, made me a 10 times better videographer than anybody, you know, than yeah. most people can imagine. Because, you know, just the, the no f-stops and depth of feel and how to make things look 3D. Yeah. with a, a normal camera and then they give you these high definition cameras you can do wonders it's such an, uh, and seeing myself on television mm. uh, uh, <laughs> that's powerful right that, that, that's, that's scary super powerful that's scary yeah. I mean we did live shows for like six seven years and then uh, I was well bounced bounced and, the hall. Uh, I got to see, we, I went to my house and <laughs> I set up the cameras and went out. And we did that for five, six years. But at that time, I got a chance to look some of my old stuff and just reviewing. And, you know, well, you said you were nervous and, you know, and all this other stuff. Wait till you see yourself <laughs> on camera. You're never nervous. <laughs> <laughs> I, <hope not. laughs> I just want to, yeah, sorry. I want to piggyback on what you're saying that we, um, uh, one of the things that Tulloch Equity now co-hosts with the Community League of the Heights and also the AME Zion Church on the Hill Good. once a month Good. is the Harlem-Washington Heights 
education film screening and community discussion series. Mm -hmm. And I, I bring that up because on Monday we showed a wonderful uh, pair of films, one by the Washington Heights Inwood Youth Council, mm -hmm. and they made a film about uh, alcoholism mm -hmm. uh, and, and access to alcohol in our community mm -hmm. for folks who are under the age of 21. And it was a powerful five-minute film. They came, we had one of them on the panel, okay. one of the other youth council members came there. There was another one that was also produced by local young people Mm -hmm. uh, by the Partnership for a Healthier Manhattan at Mount okay. Sinai and the Educational Video Center. So, and uh, talking about Youth Channel, MNNL, Barrio Firehouse, oh, yeah. you can you can watch some of this stuff online. You, right. YouTube it, look it up on YouTube yeah. to see. Our, and our young people are not just watching TV; yeah. they're making television. Mm -hmm. Yes, right. That's it. Don't just watch it; make television. Make it. And uh, the, the product, the, the qu high quality product they come up with is phenomenal. And the equipment yeah. that we have today is phenomenal. I mean, it really is. I mean, just in the past two, three years, I mean, what's been coming out, it is blows your mind. Definitely. This is the new equipment we got here, mm -hmm. I doubt. This is, this is six months old. And I think I shared with you that we recently got a grant from Sony for right. the Boys and Girls Club of America it's to be able to develop a photography program mm -hmm. at our Frederick Douglass Academy Clubhouse, right. which okay. is going to allow us to be able to teach young people how to use state-of-the-art equipment. And uh, you know, we got laptops as well as uh, the software that goes with it. Mm -hmm. And they'll be able to not only produce their own photography uh, portfolios, but then they'll be able to participate in a national competition okay. to compete against other clubhouses around the United States and then you know when uh, winners of that will go on you know to be able to win other kinds of prizes and as well so we're definitely looking to force that in the community as well so the next Winston Gills Chris is probably going to come out of uh, oh, hey, Club of oh you should see it rubs off on you All right, you know we're going to take a, a quick commercial break talking about the Boys and Girls Club let's listen to Colin Powell talk about the Boys and Girls Club all right, and we'll come right back at you. Just a short piece, two minutes, all right? Be right back at you. Can you run that for me, please? Colin Powell. I'll have a chance to see some of the other rooms in this state-of-the-art Boys and Girls Club, number 2000 Boys and Girls Club. I thought to myself, I see all that steel, I see all that cinder block work and electrical work and air conditioning work and it takes about this much stuff to make a jail it's about what it would take and that's what we've been doing too much of in recent years we've been using this kind of material and treasure to build jails to put our children in eventually no other civilized nation in the world has as many people in jail as we have in jail. So we need more mentors. We need more places like this, where the community comes together and says to the young people of the community, and especially in this neighborhood here, we care about you. Because you see, what these young people are seeing, not just a nice place to play basketball or in the computer room to run a software program, they don't see steel and cinder blocks alone what they see are people who care about them. what they see are people who love them what they see are people who have expectations of them and about them and will not let them fail we do not have anything more important to do than to protect youngsters like this and put them on the road to success the choice is very simple we either build our children or we build more jails it's time to stop building jails and get back to what we know how to do as Americans, and that's to build our children. What am I, you know, uh, that's a general there, talking about what we should be doing. Uh, he needs to direct, he's directing us now to build more the schools and less jails. Now, this is our problem. This is where black people wind up most of the time. Now, what happened to us? Why? What's, um, I mean, you guys are a little younger than us, and um, give us a clue what's happening in our community today with the youth. What sort of problems are you running in with the Boys and Girls Club? I mean, this is, you gotta catch them when you're young. When they're young, Absolutely. you know, uh, um, all of us could have went any, diff any different directions uh, at thir 12, 13, 14, 
I mean, I was under the foot of my father when I was a kid, so I couldn't walk too far. Mm -hmm. You know, I, 11 years old, I was selling newspapers. You know, I was, he gave me my last suit when I was 12 and told me, you got to get your own. So I was always, and this is New York, you always could find something to do mm -hmm. legally. All right, right. it's not that right. easy today. But um, I, always set, I was always set on doing something legal. So I didn't have to wander the different pet. I did that when I was <laughs> over 40, you know, 39. I did the, never mind. <laughs> <laughs> Who guided you in that direction? Who my guided you? My father. Your father. It was just a temper. Yeah. I mean, we're talking about the 50s, okay? Yeah. I mean, I was selling newspapers when I was 52, okay? I, I'm old school, so. I mean, we weren't allowed to do anything less. You know, if you walk down the street and somebody saw you doing something wrong, you know, your father and mother found out about it. I was more afraid of my father than I was the police. You know, uh, he was a terror. Terror, he was a terror in my, he just looked at me and I knew I had to do something yeah. to get out of his way. And I wound up, you know, I just discipline. Uh, I couldn't mm -hmm. do nothing wrong. And you but, had someone in your life. I mean, can we talk about mentoring for a moment? Yeah. Well, and, uh, that's you all I'm have a strong to. mentoring program, uh, Wayne. And uh, we heard Colin Powell mention it. You mentioned your father who yeah. had a, a huge uh, impact on your life oh, yeah. around guidance and knowing right from wrong and staying on Being the right honest. path. Back in um, August, which is la still last month, we're not in October yet, uh, Total Equity Now and Harlem Cares teamed up. Mm -hmm. for the first annual Harlem Mentoring Fair. Amen. We brought together, it's a very simple concept, we brought together 11 organizations under one roof. It was actually at Minisync Townhouse okay. mm -hmm. uh, yeah. over there at 140 Lennox and first, and Lennox, first yeah. 142nd mm -hmm. Lennox. Mm -hmm. And uh, 11 organizations, we brought them together, one, to, to connect with each other, but more importantly, to recruit prospective mentors. Mm -hmm. Over the years, I've been a mentor a few years now, and I've talked okay. to the folks who are mentors who run mentoring programs, and they tell me that they have a hard time finding uh, folks, adults, who want to step up and give an hour, an hour and a half of their time a week. Um, okay. And they find it particularly difficult to find men of color right. who are willing okay. to make that commitment. And not to, there are a lot of men who are mentoring, so not to, you know, sometimes we paint with too broad a brush and we say, oh, we're not taking care of responsibility. There are people who are doing the right thing, but not enough. So we have thousands of young brothers and young sisters out there in our community in Harlem and elsewhere who don't have the type of guidance that your father provided right. to you. I know. Um, and um, uh, we need to do a better job. I mean, I think structurally and in terms of the system, we have to hold the system accountable for providing the resources and educational opportunities and guidance that we need sometimes. But we as a community, we as community mm -hmm. members, as Harlemites have to step up. It's an hour, an hour and a half a week. I don't know if that, yeah. Wayne, what's your, the, in terms of the expectation, you actually that's, were that's, out there. That's within the same time frame. Same time frame. Yeah. And you all had a representative, yes, Edith, uh, Messiah, Edith Messiah, was yeah. there uh, tabling as one of the exhibitors. But uh, it's not a huge investment of time. Mm -hmm. Think about how much time we spend watching TV. You should spend right, right, your right, hour a week right. watching Winston. Yeah. But, but we could all cut back on other things that we're doing yeah. in order to help our young people develop appropriately and, and give them the support they need. So it's simple. Thousands of young people need our help. We have thousands of adults who could step up. Well, Let's I do can, it. I've been talking uh -huh. to a lot of old men. Dillard, if you're watching this show, I want you to call up and leave your name and number. He's, he's my age. He's coming out of my old school. Dillard, I mean, you hear me, right? <laughs> I know you're watching this one. Well, I, I just wanted to put... Now, I, you know, I'm going to put up a call-up number, and you can call in and just leave your name and number if you want to help. And also, we got a... Well, Wayne, tell us what your, your outlook is. Okay. You're a family. You've got four kids now. Right. So yeah. you've you got to be a discipline in your own house. Well, certainly. Uh, uh, four, three of the four are boys. Yeah. So um, right. I'm definitely always yeah. conscious of, of how I'm rearing them right. and ensuring that they have certain values instilled in them. I come from a Caribbean background. And okay. It was very, that you know, always helped. It was very strict in my household yeah, as yeah, well. Yeah, and yeah. I, too, had the parents that were big disciplinarians mm -hmm. and also stressed the importance of education. So right. that's the same thing that I foster in my right children, the importance of education and getting good grades. In fact, one of my sons, I'm proud to say, is in the DREAM program, which is a specialized cool. program through the Chancellor's Office to help young people Incredible. to be able to prepare for the specialized high school exams starting in the sixth grade. Okay. So as opposed to just waiting till the eighth grade when mm -hmm. they're, you know, when most young people are thinking about high school, they actually start two years early mm -hmm. and go through an intensive training. So it's more um, programs like that, which I understand averages about $1,500 to take a course mm -hmm. through Kaplan on one of those sources. This wow. is something that was provided for 
free. And he mm -hmm. was one yeah. of literally a thousand students within the school, the only black male that was selected out of mm -hmm. the three students to be in this particular program. You know, so what I hope that we could do, and to speak to your earlier question about the challenges mm -hmm. that are going on and that we're seeing as facing in the community, is the gang involvement. That's right. something that I talk right. to my son a lot right. about, the importance yeah. of staying away from that. I say, you have a strong family base. Most young people use the excuse of not having family as a reason to join gangs. So yes. I let them know, you don't have that excuse. So you have a very That's active right. father, active mother, parents mm -hmm. that are that love you, care about you, and take care of you. So what we see in, in particular in Harlem is a lot of conflict going on between the different different public housing projects where, yeah. you know, Grand Houses or Manhattanville Houses are in conflict with one another, sometimes in some cases even shooting each other's residents. And we, we had a young person that was actually in our club who was related to an individual that was shot. Mm -hmm. And one day we were taking them to the Apollo to uh, see Shaka Khan uh, oh, perform, yeah. mm -hmm. and he literally said, I can't walk that way. We need to go in a different direction because I'm afraid to go wow. in that direction because of what happened to my brother. So, you know, when they're conflicted with those kinds of issues in their own community, then we know that we have to do more to try to ameliorate the conditions in our community in an effort to get them to understand that they do have caring adults, as what Joe was uh, alluding to, that are, are willing to step up and to help them to find a better way. And mm -hmm. uh, generally, it's during the hours of after school that we found, which is mm -hmm. what makes Boys and Girls Clubs and other after school programs so important because mm -hmm. those hours between, you know, 3 and say 7 p.m., that they tend to get in the most trouble. That's right. So if they're involved in constructive activities and, that are helping them to develop their character and their leadership and a sense of community, then it takes them away from the, 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 the deterrence of the street. Mm. Yes, that's, that's one of the things that Joe de Blasio commented on during the campaign. Um, Bill he, de Blasio. Bill. Bill. When I say Joe, Joe yeah, I'm mm -hmm. sorry. Joe Ota. He's a <laughs> yeah, Joe. I got Joe the Democrat. Yeah, mix them all up. You're getting older. Unity. <laughs> well, maybe I'm glad to be getting right. older because if you're not getting older. <laughs> but um, that was one of the things that he commented on, mm -hmm. you know, after school programs. And you're right. That is the, when I was in the department, and we kept stats on everything, between three and seven was the time That's that it. the teenagers got in trouble. That's right. So there is, there is a desperate need for them to be engaged. And I'm not just talking about playing basketball, because mm -hmm. everybody doesn't want to play basketball. Um, some kids might be interested in stamp collecting. Others are interested in fencing. Others are interested in swimming. You know, there's a broad gamut of, of interest that children have. And we need to sit down with them and ask them, mm -hmm. what are you interested in? What do you like? Mm -hmm. And then maybe prepare programs. You know, if you got 30 kids and find out what they like and, and work in that area, but also exposing them to things they have no knowledge of. Mm. And have them say, you know, things that make you go, hmm. What happened in music in the schools? That's a good That's question. A <laughs> community board, uh, just a like community board nine member, uh, Judith Insel. Uh, and some of you may know her. She's former director of music at Harlem School of the Arts. Yeah. Uh, yeah. She co-sponsored right. a recent forum where they talked about the lack of, in some schools, yeah. or the uh, mm. inadequate amount of music and art and, and uh, sort of visual art instruction which I believe has been decimated over the past, I don't know how many years, uh, due to Bloomberg, budget cuts. The Bloomberg and yeah, we, we have to talk, let's keep it real. Giuliani let's keep it real. And it's the same thing with after school programs. I was at a, uh, a different community board meeting uh, a few months ago. We're talking about, it was a, they were threatening the cuts mm -hmm. uh, for after school right. programming, I mean, right? I know yeah. you all were probably yeah, threatened too. You probably got a hit. Yeah. Were you hit? Yes. Yeah. yeah, and this is a game that we play, and it's terrible. It's, it's really, it's a game that every year, uh, we have to fight to restore, right, the mayor or whoever threatens to cut a certain amount of after-school mm -hmm. programming, uh, program funding, and then the city council and other folks, rally, we have to, folks have to rally to restore it. But I'm not sure that we ever actually expand the pie, right? So we know there's so many more young people who need that support, and yet we're playing this game where we cut, a, you know, we threaten to cut it, then we restore it, but we only go back to up to the same level, if that. A lot of times we're chipping away at sort of a base, baseline funding. Mm -hmm. So we, instead of playing that game, we're just filling in the gap. We need to actually increase 
the amount of funding and support to folks like Wayne and his team at the Harlem Boys and Girls Club can do their job and serve even more young people and serve them uh, even better. I'm sure if you had additional resources, you have dreams of what Definitely. you would, would be able to do. There's so many other nonprofits and other groups in our yeah. community mm -hmm. who are threatened every year with these crazy budget cuts. We need to put a stop to that. You know, yeah. we need to rally around that so we don't have to put as much advocacy energy into just filling in the gap rather than expanding the yeah. pie. John Lou talked about that. I was in a meeting with him a couple of years ago, and he's, you know, he comes from the business world. He's an actuary. And he said to me, he said, Spoon, I know where the money is in this city. There's, there are tons of millions of dollars, but it's not being given to the people that need it. Right. It's not being allocated to the poorer communities of the city. He said that. So with whoever, you know, if, if um, Bill de Blasio is, is the mayor, you know, this is something that we have to go after. How these budgets are put together, Charles Barron has spoken about how massive the city budget is. Uh, the, I forgot how many hundreds of billions of dollars. It's larger than the, the budgets of many, many countries. Um, but the programs, the music, arts, and what they've been doing with the Board of Ed, a friend of mine who was an art teacher for 20 years, they told him he was going to teach math. Hmm. He said, I don't have a background in math. Yeah. They said, if you want your job, you teach math because they cut out the arts program. Mm -hmm. It's wow. ridiculous. And they're bringing in people to teach subjects. I know a woman, they told her she was going to teach Spanish. She approached my mother-in-law to learn Spanish. And this woman doesn't even speak Spanish. How can she teach <laughs> Spanish? That's crazy. Why is you it You know, that we've got a phone call here. Okay, let me stop. Let's see if we got a volunteer. Huh? <laughs> Maybe. And we have to talk about the fair that's coming up on the yes, tip. Yes, absolutely. Uh, let's, uh, on the phone, uh, we have who? Phone caller? Put them on, please. Seek Somebody out, on the line? Seek out Chester Higgins. Chester Higgins. World no, Hello? Hello? Photographer. Yes, uh, how you doing, gentlemen? Uh, uh, Good afternoon. Good afternoon. How you doing? My name is Carl Sands from Harlem. How you doing, Brother Wayne? Hello, uh, sir. I just wanted to make a couple suggestions. Surely. Uh, the thing is, brother, y'all doing a fantastic job, brother, and we really need this. is very significant. Uh, I was thinking about uh, what about teaching the young people about the history of our people because oh, yeah. by doing that, that will instill in them something which could keep them from getting in trouble. Yeah. Brother Wayne, yes, I work with you at Columbia University. You know me. I definitely want to know how I can volunteer to help you and Brother Roger, and I want to commend Brother uh, Winston and Brother Weatherstone for having this show, because you please respond to it. Okay. Well, leave your phone number to start with to the operator. Operator, would you take these phone calls? I mean, num names and numbers, if you can. So we can keep track of these people. I'm sorry. Go ahead. And to start, I'll, I'll give you the number to the club where you can reach okay. me at the office. That's 212. Hold on, please. 283-6770. That's the number at the club. 283-6770. And I'd definitely love for you to give me a call tomorrow morning and or tomorrow okay, at any time that you're available. And we can speak about specific strategies in which to engage the youth. But definitely, uh, Winston and I were just recently talking about the importance of teaching history to our young people because as the old adage goes, if you don't know where you came from, That's you don't it. know where you're going. And, and we believe strongly in that to develop a cultural That's component. Right, in fact, uh, this summer, in our Summer Leadership Academy, what we did was the theme of it was New York City culture. And we did things like take young people to the African burial ground as well as to the Met. So they got an opportunity mm -hmm. to see both sides of culture, history, and learn different things that they often don't learn about because they don't get outside of their community uh, enough, quite frankly. Beautiful. So we're all about exposure at the Boys and Girls Club, and, and certainly I'd love to hear from you. Uh, this is not the last time board, you see, I you see Wayne. Board. Excuse me? Okay, thank you. Uh, any, oh, that's it. Um, are you on time, Joe? Yeah, I'm, I'm getting toward the end well, of it. I have to run up to okay. I, I well, apologize again. Tell us again. about what you wanted to say. Absolutely. And I just want to also, leave. the brother had asked, um, how, do you, how can you get involved or learn more about what we're doing? If you go to Facebook.com slash Total Equity Now, Facebook.com slash Total Equity Now, uh, you can learn more about some of our upcoming events and, and projects. 
And then you can uh, email info at totalequitynowharlem.org, info at totalequitynowharlem.org. Mm -hmm. And I'd uh, love to hear from you, and we can find a way for you to contribute uh, in some way. So I do, before I go, I, I thank you for the opportunity. Sure. Uh, two quick things. One, I think all uh, the Boys and Girls Club, I think you all will be present on Saturday. Saturday is Community Board 9's Sixth Youth Resource okay. Expo. I am not a member of, I'm no longer a member. I, I was a member of Community Board 9. But I still help out a little bit with okay. this expo. You have dozens of community organizations, again, under one roof, right. uh, all with free and low cost programs for children, okay. teens, and families. Great. It's going to be at uh, City College of New York, okay. entrance of 138th Street right. and Convent Avenue. Uh, it's free, it's entirely free, and there are a few workshops there on issues such as Common Core, how to get into college for our young people. So there's okay. some high school students there, some co uh, Columbia Can University I bring a students. Uh, you should be able to. I'll refer you to, to CB9 just to make sure. Okay. It's not my place, but I can definitely um, connect you with them, and I'm yeah. sure they'd love to have you okay. come there, and you can maybe roll a clip later. Yeah. Uh, I'm carrying a book, and uh, if you see me in Harlem, it's a rare day. Uh, if you don't see me with a book in my hand, I think we talked about this last yeah. time. And I'm doing this because uh, it's not Literacy Across Harlem Day, which is the first day of every month. We right. ask Harlemites to carry their reading materials publicly, conspicuously, and proudly as a celebration of our identities as readers and writers. I'm carrying it because this is what I happen to be reading now. And also because I want to plug the uh, second annual Literacy Across Harlem March, Book Drive, and Community Celebration. I don't know if you can zoom in on this. I don't know if you. I know you got some new new equipment there, so I don't know if you can bring it in a little bit That's or where I should put it. But uh, I, you'll find this on our Facebook page anyway. So, uh, but anyway, so last year we did this in conjunction with the Harlem Book Fair, the Schomburg, the Harlem YMCA, mm -hmm. uh, number of our community bookstores. This year we're remixing it a little bit. It's the beginning of the school year, mm -hmm. so we're asking folks to meet it on October fifth, Saturday, October fifth, one thirty p.m. at either La Casa Azul Bookstore. It's the only uh, Latino bookstore specializing okay. in dual language books at 103rd Street and uh, Lexington, or at Sisters Uptown Bookstore and Cultural Center, which is at Amsterdam and 156th Street. Uh, you're going to carry in one hand when you meet there with your neighbors, your family members, your colleagues, your classmates, your, your children. Carry in one hand your favorite book of all time. Carry in the other a book to donate to a homeless shelter, adult or family literacy program, foster care program, mm -hmm and so on and so forth, right there in Harlem, right in our community. Mm -hmm. So it's about Harlemites helping Harlemites. And as we march down the sidewalks from these two bookstores, wonderful bookstores, check them out, we're going to meet in uh, Marcus Garvey Park at the okay. Richard Rogers Amphitheater, okay. right there at 122nd and, and Mount Morris Park West. We go to the amphitheater, and we're going to place our donated books one at a time, right, as people arrive and stack them, hopefully hundreds high, on that stage as a visual and symbolic representation of our legacy, right? Harlem right. Renaissance. Right. And also our, our present, we're readers and writers in Harlem, and our future, we're committed to reading and to promoting reading among our young people and our adults who Amen. are also trying to improve their reading skills. So Saturday, October 5th, 1.30 p.m., La like Casa Azul Bookstore in the East, Sisters Uptown Bookstore in the West, in the Marshall Center, and I hope to see you all there. Uh, if you're interested in organizing a group to participate, wear your group T-shirts, your organization T-shirts. Uh, I would love to hear from you. Again, info at totalequitynowharlem.org. We're going to have a great time. Hope to see all of you there. And bring your camera to that one. Okay. Bring your camera to that one. And I uh, hope you can make our fair. Yes. Uh, October 10th. Uh, you're going to hear more about this uh, uh, I'll let Wayne tell us Terrific. about it. Yeah, we can help promote that as well. We'll put it up yeah. on our Facebook, we'll okay. tweet it, we'll put it on Instagram. Thank you. We got your back, so, so I'll I know tell you're you doing what, great uh, works. Let me, let me do this roll in first and then we'll come back and we'll give Joe a chance to, to get to his next appointment. Uh, would you roll the next roll in for me, please? Now, this is about our youth, and it's about, it's a, it's a, actually, it's a movie that, that um, Hidden Colors, which everybody's got to see. I mean, and it was given to me by Wayne Francis, our n new executive director. My favorite of Boys thing about the Boys and Girls Club is the trips. And my favorite thing about the Boys and Girls Club no, not that one. is no, not the, to relax that's the wrong and have fun. And that's do the wrong one. Around. My favorite thing about the Boys and Girls I thought they looked kind Five of young. minutes. Yeah, that's, <laughs> the, that's the one with uh, right. hit the club. Yeah, that's with the club. It's a different one. Uh, it was the one we downloaded. Hi, how you doing? 
racism definitely took a toll on black yeah, male female relationships, especially in the 1960s, because in the 1960s, black men and black women, they were doing what they were supposed to have done in, for a long time, which was fight together against white supremacy. They were doing this with the civil rights movement. So what happened, people had to come in and infiltrate and have a divide and conquer um, strategy between black men and black women. In 1964, government came in and they pulled black women to the side and they started to classify black women and women in general as minorities. In 1964, that's the first time they classified women as minorities. So they started to give them set-asides and benefits and then they created the, the feminist movement and a lot of sisters branched off into that and that kind of created a rift because a lot of sisters stopped fighting for civil rights and they started to fight for women's rights but women's rights weren't being jeopardized in the black community our first priority was racism and we should have dealt with that first we wanted to be free we didn't need any boundaries need no man to tell us what to do well we hadn't had no man to tell us what to do anyway you couldn't tell us what to do in slavery so who you know we didn't really have no fight with you about that. That was the white woman's fight with her man, but we took it on. I want to be free. Ain't nobody going to tell me what to do. And then women started having babies, what they call out of wedlock, and then that got to be okay too. Oh, it's all right. Once it got accepted by society, all of the rest of the people, then it was okay then to just have a baby. In fact, I don't even want him for nothing but to just have a baby. And then we started saying, oh, I'm going to be the mother and the father. All kind of nonsense. And so what happened was that movement and was a sisterhood in the women's liberation movement between the black woman and the white woman. Because you have to understand in the tactic of the art of war, when you want to destroy a stronger enemy, you have to get rid of the, the cultural perspective of uh, authority. So what do you do? You have to destroy the man in the society. And that's exactly what they did. I talk about this in my book. You have to destroy the masculine principle, which is the head of the family. That's part of it. The other part is to get rid of the environment and the ways and means for the head or the authority of that family to become and stay the authority and the head of that family. And that is to be the provider and the protector. Take away his means of providing. Take away his means of protecting his family. And he no longer has any rights or any kind of uh, power. So when you have done that, you have now undermined the glue that keeps a family together. Men don't have to be men anymore. So what's the best thing to do? Since you're giving so many favors to women, I might as well be a woman. Or at least act like one. And therefore, I'm no longer, as Dr. Francis Christ said, I'm no longer a threat. If whites are involved in their genetic survival, and they are threatened by black male masculinity, then it will occur, I have to reduce his masculinity. Yeah, we just recently had the president at Morehouse have to say the male students cannot wear high heel shoes and dresses and carry purses. So something is happening, again, within the total context of a system of racism, white supremacy. Neely Fuller, who wrote the uh, textbook for victims of racism, a number of years ago, in, 19, in the late mid-70s, he used to say in the system, because he was the first person to talk about racism as a system, and he said that as the system of racism and white supremacy moves on, the system is going to have black men wearing dresses. Now, to hear that in the 70s, people said, oh, this is way out. And here we are. You see, there's some black pediatricians who are saying we are developing epidemic levels of the effeminization of young black males. Well, I say the pants hanging it, sagging down, is just a subconscious invitation for homosexuality. You see, it's revealing the buttocks. See, so the pants are getting lower and lower and lower. The next step is to step out of the pants altogether. And so you step out of the pants, you're going to put on a dress. The effeminization is an essential ingredient of white genetic survival. And the only thing that can prevent it is black people becoming conscious 
or becoming determined that this is not going to happen to them because if the black men are destroyed, then the black people are gone and we have a state of genocide. <laughs> All right. Now, I'll give me each of you, I'm going to give you back a copy of that so you can see the whole thing. You've got to see this movie, man. Mm -hmm. Hidden Colors. A lot of stuff in this movie, but you can see the basic principles of uh, what they're doing. Plan genocide. Give th black females all the power. Came from the feminine movement way back, and he was talking about 63. When they saw they were making progress, that people were getting together. The Jews and blacks were working together for the freedom of everybody. And then it started then. 63, we had the March on Washington. We also had the missile crisis Cuban in 63. Crisis. We had, I mean, it was a critical year. You had the bombing, the burning, bombing Assassination of JFK. <coughs> JFK died November 26th. I was particularly touched that year because my mother died that year. October 22nd, 63. So uh, that's 50 years ago, all right? So, I mean, I was just thrown into a, a, I was, I was in the Marine Corps, so I was particularly crazy. And you know, all this stuff was happening and I was going every which way. But this is just planned genocide. And you see this, give us your re response to that. Well, certainly um, it, it underscores that what we're seeing today isn't a new issue. Right, You know, exactly. it, it, it's deeply rooted in, in, a, in a past that, um, that depicts how misguided our young people are Amen. Have, and have been for quite some time. And if I could just do a shameless plug, these are the kinds of issues that the Boys and Girls Club gotcha, exactly. attacks head on in regards to not just dealing with making sure young people have fun and, and you know, engage in recreational mm -hmm. activities, but working on character, right. working on leadership. Right. Yeah. Because if you have a good, strong sense of who you are, right. and if you understand that as a, as a young man who's growing up to be an, an adult male and one day father figure or, yeah. or leader in your community, yeah. then you have a different sense of respect for yourself, a different sense of your identity and the responsibility that comes with being a man. In other words, there's a, one of my um, coaches, Coach Gustus, used to say, you're male by birth, but a man by choice. Mm -hmm. Amen. You know, so it's, right. it's, it's Amen. A, one is a factor of genetics and the other is a factor of a conscious choice and being a will. So not every, um, same thing, uh, not every father is a dad. Right. You, you know, you can uh, make a child, but are you a dad to that child? Are you someone who's being responsible, taking care of the responsibilities that come with being that parent, whether you're with the mother or not? And those are the kinds of things that we not only foster in the children, but certainly um, when I have an opportunity to mentor other young men, I do that as well. My fraternity, Phi Beta Sigma, as well as my lodge, Adelphic Union Lodge, which is a, a Prince Hall Lodge, we consciously go out and work with men to make them better so that way they can be responsible citizens and, and take responsibility and ownership for their communities and for their families. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Right. Yeah, this is a continuation of Willie Lynch. Amen. There you go. Um, unfortunately, a lot of women have bought into the program. Um, by classifying women as a minority, by classifying black women as a second minority, a woman will get a job easier than a black male. Mm -hmm. Because if they have to meet certain federal regulations right. in, in their human resources, they're covering two slots. They're covering the minority woman and they're covering minority black mm -hmm. by hiring one woman as opposed to hiring the black male who only covers and meets one requirement. Mm -hmm. right. And these are the games that are being played. Um, single parenting, toxic, toxic, especially in this day and age. Yeah. We have so many young women who didn't finish school and they're being manipulated by the Board of Ed. Oh, your son, he, he doesn't sit still. Uh, we need to give him Ritalin. We need to do this. We put him in special oh. ed. And those boys ACS. are being written My off, goodness. written off because the mothers are not educated. And they're not interested in looking out for the welfare of their child. They're caught into the system. And it is, it is vicious. A young woman 
You want to hear who, from the public? Uh, I'm sorry. Yeah, a young woman that grows up in a household without a father will virtually have problems in determining what kind of man she wants in her life because there was no male representative. And for women to think, oh, I can raise them, I can be the mother, you can't. No more than a man can be the, the mother to a child. Right, there is a balance that has to be maintained. Yeah. Uh, can we get, uh, who's calling? From Manhattan, Jackson? Yeah, I'm Jackson, uh, Manhattan. Right. Uh, uh, yeah, Mr. Grant hit on the, on the right note. The making of a slave by Willie Lynch. And right. you can go up and get the DVD on 125th Street for one dollar. What, the Willie Lynch? The Willie Lynch. The making of a slave, yes, the by Willie Lynch. The making of a slave, yeah. or the Willie Lynch. I'm going to yes. come buy one. Yes. We'll put clips on the show. Absolutely. All right. Okay. Did you, what are you thinking about that clip we showed? What did you think about the clip that we just showed? We only have a few minutes. I loved it. All right. I loved it. I loved it. All right. You want to help mentor some Never of these kids? You want to help mentor some of these kids? Yes, I could do that. Okay. Make sure we have that. your number. But I try to do that every day in the street. Amen. Because I work all five boroughs, so I try to talk to the kids in the street. Well, just make sure we keep in contact, and we'll see what we can work out together. All right? Thank you for calling. All right? So we're going to give us a plug. Tell them about the affair coming up. Uh, if anybody want to call in and join the team, uh, helping the Boys and Girls Club, we're doing a fundraiser October 10th. Uh, yes, uh, on October 10th. Uh, at Riverbank, the Riverbank Grill, which is located in Riverbank State Park. Well, we're having our annual fundraiser. It's going to be, it's, the theme of it is called Autumn in New York. And basically it's an evening in support of the Boys and Girls Club of Harlem where we're inviting uh, community constituents, friends, uh, those who uh, have a vested interest in youth development to be able to come out and help us develop the resources that we need to be able to continue to support our three clubs. Uh, the cost of the event is only $100 for your donation, and uh, you know the, you can purchase tickets online at our website, which is www.harlembgc.org. Again, that's www.harlembgc.org, and it's October 10th at Riverbank State Park. We'd love to have your support for anyone who'd be willing to come out. Or if you'd rather come uh, and buy a ticket from me. <laughs> <laughs> or that. <laughs> uh, you know, you got my number there. Bev, put my number up real quick. Our number, 917-209-5307. You can call the Gilchrist Experience and get tickets. And I want all volunteers, anybody who wants to help out, you're always calling up and saying we do a great job here. Well, this is one of our futures, our, our kids. We all know that. Mm -hmm. We all got a problem in, uh, with dealing with young youngsters, man, and we need to give them some direction. Keep them out of the streets and into the clubs. As um, no way, I was power. mentioning earlier yeah. in, in terms of photography. Mm -hmm. um, Chester Higgins, he's a photographer for the New York Times, okay. but he has photographed our people around the world mm -hmm. in all societies. And uh, I think he would be a great asset if he had some time, if you had children that were interested in photography. Gordon Parks is gone. Um, he was another great one. Yeah. I, I met Chester Higgins at the African Burial Ground years ago. And I was handling security for um, Felicia Rashad and Maya Angelou and others, Catiato Diallo. And I was moving out of the way he was seeking to take a picture and every time I moved I see he's he's moving with me and I said you know can I help you he says yeah I want to take your picture I said me I said those are the celebrities over there he said no I was looking at the intensity in your face as you were watching the crowd so I said well who are you he says I'm Chester Higgins I said oh my god now the name I knew I didn't know the face mm. so I dropped to my knee <laughs> <laughs> Literally dropped to my knee and, and held his ankle. He laughed, but he wound up taking my photograph. And I was honored by the fact that this historic photographer mm -hmm. wanted to take my picture. 
Uh, my son is a self-taught photographer, and he shot a lot of ads for the Department of, of the Navy, mm. and I didn't even know he was doing it. He shot the cover mm. of Newsweek magazine a number of years ago, and I didn't find out about that until about a year after he did it. But our kids have talents. They just need the opportunity. They need the exposure. Uh, given the opportunity, they can do anything. That's right. And it's not just about basketball and football. Our, our folks are involved in, in careers and, and, and um, occupations uh, across the board. But we never know, we never hear about mm, them. Yeah. And the more we can expose them, bring people in that do this, that do that, an architect, a, uh, a chemist, whatever, even a mechanic. Yeah. Even a mechanic. Yeah. You know, mechanics make more money than teachers and professors. <laughs> yeah, yeah, you have to teach kids to open up their own businesses, yes. to be independent. Uh, I've been independent for quite a few years now. Uh, and, and the love of photography has always been a, um, you know, I'm a videographer now, but, uh, you know, I, I work for Reverend Sharpton. I do the live streaming of uh, National Action Network every Saturday. And it live streams to the planet. Can you imagine? I mean, uh, this is enormous. And I'm so into it that I capture the spiritual energy. I, I videotape in church for 16 years. And I know when God's in the room, you know, after having done that for so many years. And it's such a joy to really uh, capture energy, as we do here, as people respond to it. So I think it's an honorable trade, and it's a, it gives you an insight to your own spirit. And I think that's really important for all of us, to find out what God, what purpose God has on the planet mm -hmm. for. I mean, uh, to raise your four kids and teach other kids the whole community. And that's what we owe it to ourselves as a people. So this sort of nonsense that was happening in this one scene we watched doesn't happen. Feminizing our men. And this is happening all over the place. You demasculate a man we don't, and he doesn't have a job, has no way of taking care of his own. And this is the planned genocide mm -hmm. of this white supremacist society that's always been there. There's never been any different. <laughs> I mean, we need to wake up. It's always there. And for us to wage a war against each other, this is really a madness. This is real insanity. So at 57, we might as well run Denzel. And the God in me loves the God in you. And uh, stay tuned for more uh, exciting events coming from the Gilchrist experience. Gentlemen, it's been a pleasure. And um, you had five seconds. Thanks for coming, Wayne. Thank you for having me. It's Graham. been my pleasure. Live from New York, this has been the Gilchrist Experience. <laughs> God in me loves the God in you. Run the roll in, please. For many kids, a brighter future is within view, but not within reach. The boys and girls clubs help kids cross the street to a better world. In fact, most of the kids here will go on to college, but there are still thousands more who need that opportunity. With your help, they can have a bright future instead of just seeing it through a window. Support a program that works. Support the Boys and Girls Clubs, the positive place for kids.